do have. attendees I'll give it another minute enough. Let's uh, bring this meeting to order. This is the uh, August 18th, 2020 Newburyport Conservation Commission hearing uh, being, taking place on the Zoom platform. This be meeting is being recorded. Uh, first item on the agenda are the approval of the meeting minutes from August 4th, 2020. Um, do you have any comments, questions, additions? Motion to approve. Second. All right. Uh, Paul Healy. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. Jane Sender. Yes. Ron DeCola. Yes. David Vine. Yes. And I vote yes. Okay. Next item are Plum Island updates. And the. Okay. Uh, Julie, go ahead. Before we begin, um, the mayor is here and Anders Bjorngard from um, GZA to talk about um, some work that's being proposed on the dunes and reservation terrace. But before we begin with that, I just want to mention that I just got an email from MRBA that there may be a, a um, MRBA meeting on Friday, September 11th at 11 a.m. That would be on Zoom. It's tentative right now, but um, just to put a placeholder in there for you guys, if anybody would like to participate in that. Um, a formal notice will come out once they confirm that date, but we haven't had a meeting in a really long time. So I just thought that was important to mention. Um, and now um, just for the benefit of the commissioners who haven't been um, involved in this, I think I mentioned at one of our previous meetings that the city was putting together a plan to install some sandbags as an emergency measure um, along the dunes and on reservation, ter reservation terrace um, in between about 75th Street to like 69th Street um, where we had the severe erosion last spring. Um, so the plan is being developed by GZA and they are there and, and um, Anders are here tonight to talk about that as well as the blocks that were placed on the wall um, in that location. So. I'm allowing both of them, I've unmuted both Anders and Mayor Holiday right now. You guys would like to start. Good evening. Uh, this is Mayor Holiday. Um, I think a lot of you have been very aware of the loss of the primary dune and the erosion that has just been continuing, continuing over the last many, many years. And um, it's reaching a, reached a point where just about every high tide, there's top over. Uh, we had um, a pretty significant storm in April. Um, residents are very anxious and nervous about this winter season, especially with the hurricanes and tropical seasons predicted to be uh, much worse this year. I don't think we're going to be in a position we were in last year uh, with a mild winter. And uh, we've been working for uh, probably since we first were out there, and Julia was there too, uh, in the middle of February and March, walking the site with legislatures and DCR and talking about, you know, what was going on there and that we had to do something. And so you know, we've met with the Army Corps in Washington, in Concord several times. We're pushing really 
hard for the um, dredging of the Merrimack River so that the dredge materials could then replace this temporary structure we're uh, trying to put in place. Um, and I was pleased to hear that the uh, Water 2, it's a federal bill that uh, Congressman Moulton has been working on, uh, has put in that bill the dredge for uh, the Merrimack River. So we're hoping that in the next federal cycle, which would be a year from October, that we will uh, start seeing movement on that. But in the interim, we have to do something. Uh, we did two doomed nourishments, um, which essentially were sacrificial sand. The residents have contributed probably close to $40,000 over the two do nourishments in terms of trying to help. Um, and over $100,000 in terms of uh, cost and labor to the city. Uh, obviously those procedures didn't really not much. I mean, they bought us some time at that point, um, but it, you know, we're at a point where um, we're looking at about $50,000 just to be sure that we cover all costs associated with putting the sandbags. Uh, what had happened was we had started talking about protection and we're looking at talking with Secretary Theoharides about uh, whether or not we could put additional layer of the cement blocks on the first. And um, we had proposed a plan. Um, it was reviewed by DEP and all the agencies underneath her. And she said, we just can't permit this. I said, I understand. I said, but we need to do something. And she recommended a floodgate. So we began doing research on floodgates and the first one we came up with was a muscle wall. And that was part of Anders review uh, in his report where he did talk to the muscle wall folks. And you know we were encouraged because it had been uh, tested by Army Corps, but it turned out that that test was not sufficient for the type of wave action that we see on Reservation Terrace. So we stepped back and said, okay, now what we can, what can we do? So that's when these super bags um, sort of came into light and seemed to be a, the best alternative that we have. Uh, I had a conference call with our legislators today, uh, Senator Tarr, Senator DeZaglio's office, uh, Rep Mira, Rep Kelkhorse, and associate staff. Uh, they have been incredibly supportive of trying to help uh, the city move forward with uh, a permanent response to what's been going on there. So um, they, I'm going to be sending Anders' report to Secretary Thea Hardy's and uh, the commissioner of, of, of um, um, her DCR and DEP uh, to DEP and DCR uh, for their feedback because they wanted an engineering design, which is why uh, we hired uh, GZA to come in and um, evaluate uh, what possibility uh, could be placed here to try and get us through uh, this next winter or possibly two before the river is dredged. Again, I'm emphasizing that this is a temporary uh, measure um, that we believe is um, acceptable to um, DEP and uh, DCR, as well as Secretary Thea Hardy. So um, that will be our next step in terms of pushing all this information to um, the uh, state agencies and uh, hopefully we will get their blessing. And we're here tonight uh, to discuss this with you and hopefully we'll also get your support to move forward. Very concerned about also not only the homes, um, but the water and sewer infrastructure there. Um, I believe that you all are aware of the problems we had in 2015 where we lost a good chunk of the sewer system uh, during the winter. Uh, we have made some upgrades and the system is now uh, alarmed so we can respond faster, but there still is a high degree of concern about losing the water and sewer system there and the impact that would have um, on the residents. So after many years of, of numerous meetings at various levels, um, I think we've come up with a, 
hopefully a plan that we can all get behind. And I appreciate the fact that Anders is on the call to uh, answer questions. So Anders, I don't know if you wanna pick it up from here and just sort of talk about uh, your evaluation and where we are. Sure, thank you, Mayor. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Great. So as the mayor uh, really summed up nicely there, um, the situation out there is, uh, is rather dire. And uh, I would just wanna start off by reemphasizing that, uh, you know, given the limited footprint out there, the erosion that's already occurred, uh, regulatory limitations, funding limitations, it's, it's very difficult to um, accomplish the objective, which is to provide some degree of flood protection and wave uh, run up overtopping protection uh, until that uh, large scale um, nourishment project happens. But, but that's, that's our goal. And um, as the mayor said, we, we looked at uh, several different alternatives and um, ultimately settled on, on this one, which um, they're basically large sandbags. They can be filled in place. They can be filled off site, trucked in, moved with a crane or an excavator and put in place. And, and, and importantly, they can be removed. And, and that was one of the, the uh, criterion that, that we were asked to, to keep in mind is, is that this is sort of a deployable system. Um, so these uh, super sacks are about, you know, three foot cubes, maybe a little bit larger. Um, and we have uh, tried to sort of streamline the design for cost and impact reasons. Um, it basically, we, we've come up with two recommendations and um, one, one, one of those is just sort of a single row of these super sacks that are, uh, and by the way, super sacks is sort of the, that's the Kleenex versus the tissue term. So I, I use that, uh, it's generically, they're called the bulk bags, but um, so we would put one row in and, um, and possibly supplement uh, with smaller sandbags in the area where those, um, the blocks are higher between uh, basically, well, it's basically around 73rd Street um, where there's a, that new row of blocks. And um, so we, we could supplement to create a level crest of about elevation 13. If you wanna, whoever's in control of the slides, if you wanna, so these are existing conditions. Uh, okay, you jumped ahead to the uh, cross sections for this single row and let, let's back up one drawing, yeah. please. Okay, this one? Uh, number 12, I believe it is. No. It's, it's, this one, we were on number 12. Correct, oh, no. thank you. Okay, so you see these, these sections A through E and um, we're gonna be looking at those because it allows you to see it a little bit easier on the next page, but A is basically up off 75th Street and uh, D is down in between 71st and 73rd. E, e is in an area that we still have some dune left as you'll see on the next slide, Julia, thank you. Okay, this one? Yes, so, okay, going from sort of Northwest uh, is, is A and then moving to the Southeast to E um, what we would propose is a single row of sandbags sort of placed on the back corner of the existing concrete block. Now these, these sandbags, one of the reasons we like these is that they, they have an ability to sort of conform to their base. If they're scour and erosion, they're not gonna topple over like the muscle wall or, or a concrete block would. Um, they're gonna more or less shift and, and um, settle a bit um, as, as the, the potential scour occurs. So, um, but we've placed it on the back of that um, concrete block to take advantage of those blocks in their existing condition. Those are the old blocks uh, that you see on section A and B. Um, and then down on section C at the bottom left-hand corner of the frame here, you can see that there are two rows of existing blocks. And, and one of those, um, 
is the newer block that goes up quite a bit higher. So to maintain that, that elevation, that crest elevation of 13, you wouldn't need to use a big super, super sack or a bulk bag. You could, you could use smaller sandbags or sand tubes to, to level out that crest. And, and that holds true for section D as well. Um, and then we also looked at, uh, scroll down one drawing, Julia, please. We also looked at trying to get, and, and, and that, that's really a Band-Aid. I mean, it's, it's going to help. Um, and it's something that can be done with, with uh, you know, maybe it, with limited funding and it can be done in a hurry. These bags were available off the shelf. We'd fill them with compatible sand, by the way. Um, and then, uh, so, so it's, it's considered to be a very doable solution. Um, but the protection that it provides is, is quite limited. Um, so in this next concept, we tried to get a little bit uh, more protection, go a little bit higher, a little bit wider. And here you can see that there are the same cross sections for reference. Um, and if you go to the next drawing real quick, we've placed, um, and in order to stack these, these bags, you have to do it in a pyramid-like fashion to make them stable. So to get two rows of blocks high, you have to, you have to put those two underneath it. So, so there's a bit of a jump in cost. But here you can see in cross-section AA that we're trying to achieve a, a, a crest elevation of 16 um, at the west end. Now that drops down a little bit due to the geometry that's available on section CC and DD, bottom left-hand corner and upper right-hand corner, where we can, we, we're getting 15. But still, that's, that's, that's quite a bit more height um, to help with the wave run up and the overtopping. Um, even this system, even though it's more robust, it's not going to prevent overtopping. It may not prevent flooding. It could get taken out by a huge storm. Um, but again, we're trying to get as much protection as we can under the, under the limitations that we're faced with out here. Um, as I mentioned, this, this one's a little bit more expensive. One, one thing I did want to add um, is that if you're, some of you may remember the core or choir envelopes that were um, put in place back, uh, I don't know when it, exactly when it was, maybe a little over 10 years ago, um, by the blue and, and elsewhere on the, on the island. And I was speaking with Dave Lager, who's now with Sumco, just to try to get a sense to evaluate that option. And if you were to just, if you were to do that correctly with embedment, it would be quite costly. But in a scenario like this, where it's sort of a temporary um, emergency situation, if you forego that and, and you could basically just substitute those core envelopes for these sandbags. So you could use this exact same design, but instead of these super sacks, there'd be the, the, core, uh, the core envelopes filled with compatible sand. Just, just something I want to mention because the cost looks comparable and ideally um, when this goes forward, uh, the city can, can evaluate that, that cost difference. Um, so I wanted to point that out as well. Try to keep that brief to leave some time for questions because I know you probably have some. Thanks, Anders. Uh, yeah, just Anders. wanted to say one thing before oh, we uh, before you go on is that um, there was someone who said that they thought DPS put those um, uh, extra cement blocks out. That is incorrect. Uh, we did not do that. Uh, we know that you know it has to be something that is permitted, and it was self help by a resident. I assure you, we did not do that. Okay, no, I, I would believe that. Um, with regards to those blocks, uh, Anders, you're saying that you're going to be leaving those blocks there? That's what our design was based on. I, it was ironic because about five minutes after I sent this report off to uh, the city, I did get an email from Julia about concern over those existing blocks. But yes, our current design takes advantage of those blocks um, and incorporates those in to, to, to help gain as much protection as we can in, in the short term. 
Yeah, I understand that, but I'm personally not good with leaving those blocks there. Somebody illegally put them there and uh, I'm not good with it. So was there a project that was uh, brought forward and uh, we discussed it and then they had backed off of it? I was under that impression. That was the, the lower level of blocks. They, um, they were removed because there was a property, whatever. And then they decided not to go ahead with that property line thing. And I think we didn't really want them to put back at all, but they, I believe DPS put the lower line of blocks back. Um, but I don't, I don't see how we can approve something that's illegal to be part of a new design. Well, we can remove the blocks and just put the sandbags there. Absolutely. Yeah. That, right. that, that's uh, put the bigger sandbags okay. where those blocks are. That, that's you, you. You could do that, and respectfully, I understand the, the issues associated with those illegally placed blocks. But if if you could delay it. <laughs> Um, you would get um, more bang for the buck here, but that's that's just something I want to point out. And by delaying it, I mean, you know, yes, they will be removed, but they'll be removed maybe in the spring or maybe w optimistically, from my standpoint, um, a year from this spring so that we'll make it to the, uh, to the nourishment project. Well, respectfully, I have a lot of, I have a big issue with leaving them there. Uh, that that was, they were legally put up there um, for the same reason, but they're they're illegal. The other ones were, were put up put up a long time ago, um, and I'm just not I'm not good with leaving them there. I wonder if DEP uh, is going to have an opinion as well about the recent blocks that were placed. They don't want them there. Yeah. I mean, because we looked at a plan for adding more blocks there, uh, working with the secretary and uh, DEP said, we can't permit this. So we knew we couldn't do that. So that's when they gave us the floodgates and we started down another path. Because, um, you know, as I said, we've looked at every possible option that we can to protect uh, this area. So um, we would be, uh, perfectly happy to remove the blocks that are there, uh, despite the fact that they could add a little more protection. But you know, knowing um, that they are illegal and they were placed illegally by self-help by residents, and we would replace them with these super sacks. I'd just like to mention too, thanks, Donna. That that knowing um, knowing how important this area is to the residents, the longer those blocks are left there, the harder it's gonna to be to have them removed. And right. given the, the timing with implementing this project and removing them at the same time, I think might be easier for people to accept than um, the longer they stay, than pulling things out when you've already got sandbags on top of them. Um, it's just gonna be more difficult for everybody. So this might be the best time to do it. Okay. Agreed. So these these sandbags, super sacks, whatever, are they going to present a, a solid wall to the waves or is there going to be sand placed in front of them so there's a run up? Because if it's a solid wall, you're going to get a lot of scour. The wave's going to hit it and backwash and, and, and eliminate whatever sand is there. It, it will act as more of a solid wall than you know, vegetation or something like that. I mean, that, that existing row of blocks does does provide some scour protection. And I'm talking about the older blocks. Right. Um, but yeah, it's there. there is that issue. Um, Anders, do you think that using the coir bags as an alternative to these super sacks might actually offer better um, sort of wave dissipation and protection because it's a rougher surface. And just looking at the photos of those super sacks, they look like a, a more of a clean sort of a, a fabric than coir. Yeah, they're, they're relatively smooth. Um, they are um, a lot tougher than the core fabric. Um, so that's a positive. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, I, th I think potentially the, the core envelopes might 
be a little bit more forgiving in terms of the, the energy reflecting off, off the barrier. However, they are also less, so, so they're less durable. And um, Dave, I don't know if you know, Dave Vine, if you kind of lose sand um, when waves are um, washing over them from. Uh, um, I think we've uh, lost David Vine. Okay. I'm, I'm not seeing him. Um. Yeah, uh, but, but I mean, it is, I think it is something that, um, you know, is, is, is worth looking at. I, I, I think we, we've tried to keep these, both of these solutions um, kind of uh, low impact. I mean, if, if, if the bags were to tear uh, and you couldn't remove them as they are, then the sand would be compatible. So that wouldn't be a big deal. And then you'd have to go out and get the, and pull the fabric out. You know, the, the core envelopes does, they, they do have that advantage that they're, they're more uh, eco-friendly. Yeah. But and Anders, they have, yeah, go ahead. Go no, ahead. Anders, my understanding is when we were looking at that is that it would be really difficult given <coughs> the state of the, the current environment there that it would be very, very difficult for us to get onto the beach to put these things in as opposed to these sand super sacks. That, that's a good point there. They, they do require equipment on the beach to construct, whereas the super sacks can be, you know, lifted up or filled in place. So they're, mm -hmm. they, th th that's a good point. And that's so a real can't... concern. That's a real yeah. concern for us in terms of being able to, to deploy this fairly quickly. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, for me, I, I'm totally fine with these bags. I, I'd almost, because they're temporary and, you know, there we have hurricanes getting juiced up in the uh, around the equator now. Um, I'm I'm fine with putting these sorts of bags out there as long as there's a, you know an expiration date on them, um, okay. just as a temporary um, solution. Thank you. Okay. Do they, quick question: Do they need to be staked in place? Are they going to get pushed around? I mean, Anders mentioned that they. Uh, as opposed to like a block or something more solid, they won't get pushed around. They'll just sort of settle and mold to where they are. Um, so they don't need to be staked in the way like the coir bag would need to be staked in place. Is that correct? That's correct. You're, they rely on just the mass of the sand. Um, but again, you know, big waves, storm surge, um, it's, the survivability of that system is is not guaranteed by any stretch. Just want to be clear about that. Where where's the high tide? What's the distance between the high tide line and, and the current layer of blocks that are there? Yeah, if you look at this cross section here, you can see mean high tide. Any one of them, it's about three point eight two. It's a dashed line, um, and then you can see the blocks, the the older blocks range from about 10 to 12. Julia, could you zoom in on just one of the cross sections? Sure. I... Yep, sure. Okay. So that's, I mean, that's not bad, but you know, again, if you, if you have a storm surge, um, you're right up there. Yeah. So there's about 40, horizontal feet and not much vertical. <laughs> yes, Welcome back, got, David. Yep, you got about 40 feet laterally and um, about six feet vertically. Yeah. <clears throat> and so would it help if you put sand in front of the blocks and bags to, to, so that there's a slope there instead of a vertical wall that the waves are hitting? It, it would help for a short period of time. Yeah. But I think that would be pretty, you know, insignificant in terms of the, the winter season. Yeah, I, I can't imagine that sand lasting more than one or two waves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. David, you have any comments on this? Um, yeah, I, I just, I had a little technical problem here. So I missed the last couple minutes. Um, I was curious, I, I'm sorry if you already said this, what, what are the bags made out of? 
it's like a nylon uh, mesh fabric. So if you're familiar with some of the woven fabrics that might be used on a silt fence, it's similar to that. Um, so when you do these, you're going to have to remove them uh, per DEP? I mean, they're not going to allow this as a long-term solution? Or correct. These are, these are definitely designed to be removed um, once they serve their purpose. And to do, they've got these straps that are, you know, sewn into the bags. So you can pick it up with a crane or an excavator and full of sand and, and move them. You know, if, if they get damaged, you may not get all the sand, right? Because the sand may pour through if, if they get ripped by a, a log or, or something like that over a winter season. But the good part about that is you've got compatible beach sand um, and you get that fabric up and out of there. Yeah, the, where I was going with that was that you had mentioned that the core bags um, could comes in and around the same price and those could stay there because they're biodegradable. Or is that still correct? It, and that's my understanding that they're biodegradable. But I mean, one of the issues was that the fact that they could stay there makes them difficult to permit. They're not temporary. They're not deployable. Okay, and David, so the, the, and David we also looked at that and the difficulty in placing the core bags on the beach. You need equipment on the beach. That's very expensive and very difficult with the loss of beach there in order to deploy those. It would be uh, better to use these super sacks. And then at this point, just in terms of cost deployment, and we don't have a lot of time. I'm getting very nervous about the you know time factor here. Yeah, I, I would assume that these could be constructed much quicker. Right. Uh, just thinking back on those others. I mean, it would have been great if when we had had a logger out there for four and a half years ago, and that was the plan that we had come up with, but the cost was almost a half a million dollars then uh, to do these. And, you know, everybody just sort of said, well, that makes sense and walked away. And here we are almost five years later trying to figure out a solution. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the reason that was so expensive was because they were digging it down to get the uh, required scour for a permanent solution. Okay, yeah. And so these are, not, these are, and as you said, these are preferably gonna be in place until, uh, you know, not this coming spring, but the one after. Or when the dredge occurs, we're, you know, hoping that based on the bill that was filed by Congressman and the fact that we have been completing a 204 study with Army Corps of en Engineer and there is, um, their conclusion is that there is beneficial use of the sand being placed on Reservation Terrace. So that was a big hurdle to get through. So they're completing that study I'm sure it will be talked about at the MRBA meeting in September. Um, so we've you know, been working on several tracks here in terms of getting um, the funding for Army Corps engineer and completing this study. And that, uh, as I said, we've met several times in Concord with their teams. And so you know, they are clearly uh, moving forward on preparing to do the dredge of the river, which is really needed also. Oh, definitely. And um, DEP is in fact okay with this uh, temporary bag situation? Well, we'll know shortly. Um, they, when we sent our first plan, which had the concrete blocks um, and sort of talked about the history and how we're out of options, that's when uh, the secretary said to me about looking at floodgates. And that's when we started looking at other options. And um, I would be surprised if they, because they have been out, they were out in April after the storm. I've been in touch with Eric Worrell several times uh, about uh, what's going on here. Um, and they know that, you know, we are really at the end of options here. Um, so I, can't imagine that they, they wouldn't let us do this because it is a temporary 
And with the support of the secretary, um, I'm confident or fairly confident. And with the legislature support who are writing a letter today and to the governor in support of this project. So I'm hoping that with all of the different layers that we're using to sort of rally support that, that we will get there. Yeah. Are they contributing to the cost since this is their property, I think? They haven't contributed at all. And I'm very frustrated with that. And I you know, mentioned that to the secretary and to the new DCR commissioner. And so we are asking, cause we're putting, asking for 50 grand because what we want to do is tap into the Plum Island water and sewer settlement account. Um, we're, you know, have used that very cautiously. We obviously had to replace all the metals in the hydrants, uh, but we would like this cost shared. The residents have, as I said early on, contributed a lot of money towards the sand. They did indicate to me they have somewhere between five and 10,000 to help uh, in funds that they've collected. And if we could get 20, 25,000 out of DCR, uh, Secretary had mentioned that they anticipate some slip accounts, things, projects that couldn't be done because of the pandemic and that they, they potentially could um, send some money our way to help support this. Uh, that would go a long way with trying to, because I need a super majority vote from the council to use money from that fund. And if we could count on some resident assistance and DCR assistance, I think the project would move forward uh, much more quickly. Okay. The ask is there. <laughs> so would that be in addition to the 50,000 the city's coming up with where, so you could do a, maybe a more extensive and expensive project? Well, we were planning on just 50 and okay. asking for the state to come up with 20 or 25. Okay. Hi, Dan. Um, okay. Well, I, I'm good with this as long as that t illegal layer of blocks goes away. Okay. Um, and I guess, uh, you know, considering the fact that DEP would allow it, which is something very uh, unusual, but as, as long as they are and, and um, this would be removed, I, I, don't, I don't see any issue with it. Um, I mean, you're going to get more of a structure out of this than you would uh, anything else. And I guess we're at that, that point now where we need something. Yeah. So um, I don't know if I mentioned this at the beginning, but um, I think maybe the mayor and Anders could emphasize this too, is that I think that this work needed needs to get done ASAP. So as you can see, they've put together a plan with a couple of different scenarios, um, whether it's one row of blocks or two rows of blocks, but whatever they land on based on cost and, um, and feasibility of installation and all that. Um, I think that, correct me if I'm wrong, Mayor, but you all would like to move forward with implementing this as soon as possible. And that would probably mean that it would have to be done before we would get a notice of intent in to actually do the permitting. And that therefore this would require uh, an emergency certification right now. Yes, please. Yeah, I mean, that but, is we could date, but we could date that emergency because emergency certs are good for 30 days. So we could date it. Um, once we're ready when, to go. When you're ready to go. Yeah. yeah. Does that make sense to the commission? Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. You have any estimate on when you're gonna be ready to go? Well, um, we're gonna put the uh, transfer request before the council um, for their next meeting. And uh, I plan on, on, since this, I had to talk to the um, our legislators first, they're supportive. This report will go to the secretary tomorrow. And then I will let her know that um, we really do need a commitment of twenty twenty five thousand dollars $25,000 to move this project forward. So um, I will keep Julia informed every step of the way in terms of each level of, of uh, okay as we go. And hopefully we'll uh, be hearing in a few weeks from DCR that they have been able to allocate some funding here. Okay. Um, can we get those blocks removed in the meantime? Uh, 
of shore. I think, you know, I'm sure the city can use them for something somewhere off of Plum Island. Well, I'm going to talk to the homeowners and because I know who did it, I think, and um, tell them that we're either going to take them or they have to remove them. Uh, they better remove them really quick or we're going to. I know that's what I'm going to tell them. them. That's what I'm going to tell them that is that, you know, but at least I, I have a, another plan to give them to put in place. And I think that was uh, one of the concerns is that they were getting incredibly worried, especially after what happened in April. Well, um, and yeah, just a note, like a note to the public that we're not having, we're not taking any public comment during this. Public comment's gonna happen during the notice of intent. Uh, so, uh, Julie? Are you gonna say something? I was just I was just gonna mention that it looks like there's two people raising their hands for comment. But I think you answered that question right. Yeah. So um, do we want to issue this uh, emergency cert? I'll make a motion to issue the emergency certification. Second. Okay. Um, Paul Healy? Yes. Steve Moore? Yes. Jane Sender? Yes. Ron DeCola? Yes. David Vine? Yes. Uh, Dan Warshall? Yes. And I vote yes. Thank you very right. much. I appreciate it. As I said, we'll work on getting the blocks removed and I will keep Julia informed who will inform you on where we are as we move through this process going forward. Anders, thank you so much for joining tonight and helping to discuss um, the project that you have developed for us. Appreciate it greatly. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you me. both. You're welcome. Have a good meeting. Bye. Okay. Uh, the next item on the agenda is Clary Co. 2, Keolis Commuter Services, uh, request for determination. Uh, we got, Julie, did they give you any date they want to uh, con continue to? They did not respond with a date to continue, so I would recommend we just continue to the next meeting. Actually, yeah, I mean, they, they mentioned that they wanted to continue out into late September or early October. And then they didn't, re I told them what those dates would be and I never heard back on which one they'd like. So I would recommend we go to the second meeting in September for them. Yeah, that's, uh, that's fine. So that would be the 15th? Yep. Make a motion? So moves. Second. Uh, Paul Healy? Yes. Steve Moore? Yes. Jane Sender. Yes. Ron DeCola. Yes. David Vine. Yes. Dan Warshall. Yes. And I say yes. Can I get a motion to open the public hearings? So moved. So, moved. so seconded. All right. Paul Ely. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. Jane Sender. Yes. Ron DeCola. Yes. David Vine. Yes. Dan Warshall. Yes. And I vote yes. Uh, the first item on the agenda is Holly McDonald, 468th Street, notice of intent. Um, do we have, I don't know if we have anybody here for that. Um, if anyone is here for that, could you raise your hand? If Mike Seacamp or anyone else is here to speak to 468th Street, please raise your hand. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I checked the uh, DEP NOI site, and they are not even listed on there. Oh, nope. at this point. No, nope. and we didn't receive at the last meeting. We had requested a landscape plan and some other de additional details, and nothing had come in um, as of today when I last checked my email before the meeting. So, I'm assuming that they are just not ready yet and should be continued. Did we decide we weren't meeting on September 1st? I, I think we did not decide. Um, and I had a little heartburn with it, but I don't anymore. It's been, yeah, it's been recommended to me in the office that we do hold the meeting um, just for expediency sake, um, because it's a virtual meeting. Most people should be able to 
get online for their um, topic area, whereas in a meeting that we have in person, you kind of have to show up at the beginning and stay to the end. You can't check in or out. So, and we're not using a public space for this. So, um, we should hold the meeting. Yeah. So I'll make a motion to continue to September 1st. Second. Okay, Paul Ely. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. Uh, Jane Sender. Yes. David Vine. Yes. Dan Warshall, don't trip yes. what you're telling us yes. Uh, Ron DeCola. Yes. Can I vote yes? All right, next item on the agenda is Chris Rand, Seacoast Homes, LLC, 192 Northern Boulevard, Notice of Intent. And they have also requested a continuance <laughs> to the next meeting. Motion, Motion to, to continue, continue to... <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Steve, you take it. Motion to continue to September 1st. Second. All right, Paul Ely. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. Jane Sender. Yes. David Vine. Yes. Dan Warshaw. Yes. Ron DeCola. Yes. I vote yes. So are they having trouble getting DEP to approve what they're doing? Is that? Um, well, I don't know that they, I would say they're having trouble getting DEP to approve, but the conversation right now is ongoing with DEP and there may have been a stall um, in moving forward with that, but I, I don't know of any particular problems that they're having. I think there's just communication ongoing between the applicant and DEP. Okay. Yeah. All right then. Um, on to Mass Division of Marine Fisheries, Plum Island Beach, North Reservation Terrace, Notice of Intent. Um, and they do have a number, which is 051 1040. Mm -hmm. um, do we have anybody from there. Yes, we do. We have, um, let me just allow her to speak. I believe it's Mel Higgins is here. I've unmuted you, Mel. Yeah, I think you just have to now unmute. Let's see, I've unmuted you. Yeah, okay. there you go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. And Blake Martin should be on as well. Okay, let me see if I can, yep, I'll yeah. allow Blake to speak as well. Thank you. Can you hear us? Yes. 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 Okay. Great. Well, we thought we'd talk through the project tonight, but uh, your meeting. So um, let me know what you'd like us to do. Well, I would just recommend that you go ahead and um, give a brief overview of the problem and the and the proposed project. And um, I've got, as you can see, your notice of intents online here. And I'm happy to scroll through it to the plans uh, or any pages that you'd like to highlight um, while you describe the project to the commission. Okay. Well, a, a picture is worth a thousand words. This is uh, Blake Martin. Um, Mel and I have been working on this project for quite some time. Uh, a feasibility study was done a while back for the depuration plant. Um, as you know, the storms have um, moved a lot of sand and eroded things around the um, the wells that are used for the depuration fa uh, facility. Uh, many of you may know that um, that shellfish cleaning plant um, run by the state relies on two wells, which are drilled uh, down deep into brackish water, into salt water, which underlays the fresh water for Plum Island. And the, uh, the well furthest out uh, towards the beach area needs to be decommissioned. Um, it was inundated and exposed to uh, the ocean water. The pump in it um, is uh, no longer usable. The well needs to be abandoned. And so this project has two parts. One is to uh, dig a small hole around that outer well, well number two, um, and uh, disconnect the piping to it, uh, seal the piping, um, and then seal the well some uh, five to six feet below the current sand level. And under the DEP requirements, um, the well abandonment requires you to fill the well with sand to a certain level and then cement the ground surface. 
in this case, we'd like to leave it well below ground surface to allow for any future movement out there of uh, the sand and the beachfront. And the depuration facility can't live without a redundant well or a second well. And so the existing well number one is a little bit further back in. Uh, it's along an access um, your easement area. The piping runs back to the depuration facility. And uh, we propose to, uh, the second part of the project is to install uh, another well, a second well to maintain their redundancy at the facility. That well would require a drilling rig to be set up and an eight inch casing advanced to about 120 to 130 feet. Um, uh, a screen would be set and then a well would be made um, at that facility, a pump emplaced in that well and then piping connections to the existing um, water main that comes back to the plant. Again, these wells are set in the deep salty uh, zone below the freshwater zone. Um, there's no increased withdrawal. Um, we've been out to view the site. If, you, if you've been there, you'll see that there's a kind of a shallow kind of swale that leads out to both wells. There's a cut in the dunes. Um, we recommend that um, Alterna mats or some type of mats be placed before any equipment goes out to that outer well or to the uh, drilling of the second well. And with that, I'll just stop and um, let you ask questions because I'm sure there are plenty here um, for this facility. I'm, I'm curious if you have gotten the public comments. Uh, I think we received one at 6.30 today and there was one a couple of weeks ago. I have uh, been in touch with one public comment. A, a woman named Christina has asked me quite a number of questions about the facility, many about uh, the freshwater aquifer and discharge from the plant itself. Um, is I believe that's the same person who sent in the public comment today. Um, mm -hmm which I just got right before this meeting. So I forwarded it to all the commissioners, but I did not have time to forward it to the applicant before the meeting. That, that's fine. Um, yeah. we, we had submitted to MESA. Um, they've asked for us to uh, do a study of the types of uh, plants out there. And so that's still something to be done. Um, so we're not asking for approval of the project tonight unless the commission uh, would want to grant the order of conditions uh, with any additional conditions set by MISA, at this point in time, um, we expect that you will continue this project or have a continuance until the next meeting so that we can do that MISA survey of the plantings that are there and um, bring that back to you to talk about any protection measures. We currently can't see of any other protection measures than to lay some type of matting over the plants that are out there. They've shown a great resilience and if you know, um, uh, that area, it, it does kind of revegetate itself pretty readily. I'm um, curious I, what... I, I, okay, um, I, I was hoping that you would consider when you're accessing the existing uh, well number two, the one that's furthest out, if you could get to it by the beach instead of going over the, the sand and the dunes and the plants. Mm -hmm. um, That's a possibility. The decommissioning of well number two won't require a big drill rig. It would be a small light, um, say bobcat, that would allow us to dig like a three by three foot hole around the well and then cut the casing and then pour cement. Um, we could look at accessing along the beach. I don't want to get too much into soft sand and mire a rig down there and then uh, have a lot of problems, but we can certainly look at that. Um, well, it looked to me like you know, the, the high tide is coming up pretty much near the uh, well number one or well number, whatever is no, number two. So the sand should be fairly solid, I would think. Yeah, I think you might be right. Um, we can certainly try to access it that way. And if it's not, if we get mired down, we would want to move around to uh, driving down the current um, easement. Okay, yeah, I mean, I. I would hope you could consider that and, and do it if you can. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We would we would gladly stay out of any any area with vegetation if it's solid enough. Yeah. 
And the other thing I was thinking was if the new well number two, you're going to connect it back to well number one to get to the, the water main? Is that? It will be connected to the water main, not to the well, but that's correct, yeah. And you, and you were going to have to dig a ditch that was, I forget how long it was to, to make that connection? So we're going to be about 40 feet away from the existing well, but we think we'll only be within about 10 feet of the water main. So it should be a, somewhere between uh, 10 and 20 feet to reconnect that. Okay, I thought it was a longer distance, but I don't know if you would consider burrowing instead of digging. Well, part of the problem, <laughs> and I have to admit this, the, the plans that we have available to us are not necessarily as built. Um, and so we actually have to find the water main uh, and we'll try and probe down to find it and then connect on to it. Um, we have an approximate location based on the plans that have been given us. They're not uh, surveyed in. So we thought we'd move from well one in the direction that the, uh, the piping that comes off well one is that shoots over towards the water main and then try and uh, find that water main. Okay. Is it a metal pipe which you could find with a metal detector or is it plastic? I'm pretty sure it's plastic and I'm pretty sure it was laid in before any, uh, any metal detection taping was put on it, anything like that. So it's, you know, everything out there is brackish. So most of the piping is plastic. I'm just looking at the plans and it is PVC. Yeah, it's, and, and again, that's what's listed as the proposed plans. That's all we have. We don't have any as built. Okay. Would, would uh, horizontal drilling be, I, I mean, assuming that you started off doing some test pits or do something of that sort, um, once construction starts, would the horizontal drilling then make sense? Uh, it's prohibitively expensive. I think this will be able to minimize that cut uh, pretty readily. It sh we should be able to find it within 10 feet. Okay. I guess oh. the only way to to access where you're going to drill the new well is by using the mats over the over the vegetation. It really is. Um, we hope to use either a cable tool or a rotary style drill, and um, they're almost always truck mounted, rubber tired, and so we don't want the rubber tires digging in and turfing out the plants. Right. Laying mats over top is much better. Um, so these wells have been maintained in the past and maybe every 10 years a pump is replaced. Um, the pumps, the last time that it was done, uh, the machinery wasn't that big. I think it was a, a small um, style pickup truck and a, like they call it an easy up. But in this instance, the drilling rig to drill the new well will be um, much bigger. How long do you think it'll take to do all this work? Is it a couple of days, a couple of weeks? So the decommissioning of well two should take a day. The new well will probably take two weeks. Okay. Is the uh, decommissioning and the installation of the new well, are they permitta permittable activities or does the state give you permits to put these in and abandon? So the abandonment is a state, the licensed well driller will be used, will be specifying a licensed well driller to properly abandon the, the well. There's no permit necessary for a saltwater well in the state of Massachusetts. So um, since it's not a potable well, there's no other permitting activity for the new replacement well. So I guess one question I have is, um, you're gonna dig down three feet or so to, to cut this thing and, and fill it with, uh, with cement. Um, isn't, I guess I'm worried about further erosion and uh, this, the uh, pipe sitting up there, um, sticking out eventually as high as the one that's sticking out there now. <laughs> um, yeah, Joe, I, I agree with you. Um, that, 
it's actually less exposed now than it was a year and a half ago when we looked at it. Okay. Uh, um, so I don't know what to do. If you want to uh, tell us to dig down six feet, that's fine too. Well, I guess we'll dig as deep as we can go that's practical and uh, cut it off and cement it up. Um, anybody else have a, an opinion on that? Yeah, I think the deeper you can go, the better because erosion conditions out there aren't getting any better. <laughs> right. So as deep as practical, I mean, the deeper you go, the bigger the backhoe we'd need. I was trying to get out with a little backhoe yeah. or bobcat. Yeah. Um, you want to you want to just call it six feet down if we can get there and uh, four feet if not? Yeah, I, I prefer that. Just give yeah. us a little leeway. Okay. We'll, we'll specify six feet and four feet only if the engineer allows that. So the contractor okay. would have to uh, beg, beg for a uh, leniency on that one. Okay. Um, I'm kind of reacting to the, the letters that were sent in. And um, uh, I don't know, Joe, is this something that's supposed to be taken care of in the public uh, comment time? Or is it something that, uh, uh, how's, how's that going to be handled? Well, if you, if, I guess, uh, I know Christina is uh, one of the attendees. Um, and I guess she can speak okay. if she wants to, but uh, other than that, if, if you want to address things, go ahead and address them. No, I, I just wanted to make sure that, I mean, I, I personally, I, you know, I have my own opinions about some of the things that were said, but I, I, I thought it would be important that the applicant address them. And if, we, if we, we certainly are, are more than welcome to address things in writing um, for the commission. Uh, we don't expect to, again, approvals for tonight. Um, continuance till September is fine with us. We thought we would get on the slate and describe the project tonight for, for sure. Um, I think part of the issue is that there's been very, uh, there's a great public concern for the freshwater aquifer on Plum Island over the years. Um, this in no way, shape or form will be tapping the sand deposits to make up the freshwater aquifer. We're drilling below that to get to that saltwater zone. The plant requires um, sediment free, pure brackish water that's equal to what the shellfish are used to living in, and that's down deeper uh, towards the toe of Plum Island here. And I will forward um, Mel that comment letter that we got today and so that they can respond to it at the next meeting or in back in writing to the commission and, um, and mm -hmm. present that at the next meeting. Yeah, yeah, some of the questions that have been forwarded to us are about, you know, the wastewater discharge from the plant and um, other things that I'm not so sure of where they discharge their wastewater. It isn't actually the activity that we're asking you to permit. Um, so it's not a change in conditions that we really were uh, scoped to address. We were scoped to address the replacement well and decommissioning the old well. Um, there's no change in flow or operation of the depuration plant. Um, they use water as, or salt water as needed for the shellfish based on deliveries. Um, Everything at the plant has UV disinfection and um, in order to get bacteria free. And I assume they either go to the, dis to the sewer or they go to the river. Uh, um, they go to the river. I believe they have a discharge pipe that extends out into the river past where the captain's lady facility is. Yeah, again, it's a very old plant. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that's a longstanding uh, discharge. So, I, you know, there's no discharge on ground, there's no septic system discharge, no big leaching field and no impact to neighbors. I th think that's, uh, they're returning salt water to salt water and it's clean, probably cleaner than the Merrimack. So I think that's all pretty safe. So, so with that, I just ask that you um, understand our project. We'll, we'll certainly answer your questions in writing. And if you'll give us a continuance to a date certain, um, we'll be back to you to ask for approvals um, after we finish the MESA study. Okay, let me just ask, uh, is there any, are there any uh, questions from the public? You have to ra raise your hand to uh, let us know. A 
couple seconds. I do not. Oh, um, there's one, Christina Ritzy. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Oh, hi. Uh, my first time using Zoom. I'm a little uh, nervous about the whole thing. Um, I guess I had a couple of questions. Can you hear me loud and clear? Yes. Um, you're saying that the discharge of the wastewater is actually going into the river, straight into the middle of the river? Am I confused? Um, I believe, and I, I don't have all of the plans and data in front of me, but I believe they have a discharge pipe from the shellfish plant that discharges the water out after it's been used and cleaned. I believe that it's clean as it goes back out into the Merrimack River. Okay, so I guess I'm a little confused about something. Um, when the contaminated shellfish comes in and it is in a holding tank, then it gets processed with UV lighting, which cleans most of the bacteria, um, according to my research, not 100%. There's still a certain amount of bacteria left. That water then, even though it's a small percentage of bacteria, actually goes into our river. I just want to be clear about that. No, I, I actually can't. Maybe um, the folks from Marine Fisheries can comment on that, but we don't work, you know, closely with the shellfish plant and they haven't been before us for any kind of operational issues. So I can't comment on how their plant actually works. Okay. So um, why is the plant not on city sewer, um, would that not be feasible or more feasible? Again, I think you're gonna have to talk with the folks that run the plant about what their their operations entail and, and the reasons behind those types of decisions. Okay, well, I guess the questions I also had were, I don't understand why this is being called a replacement well, when in fact there are many differences between the existing well and the new proposed well. So I'm curious as to how it could be considered a replacement well when it in fact is higher up on the dune, 80 feet away. And my guess is, and that's a pretty good guess that they're gonna have to deep, dig deep, a lot deeper than the original 100 foot deep well and and i also don't understand how they're going to extract the water by not actually drilling down through the freshwater aquifer to actually extract the seawater so maybe someone can talk about that how are you going to bring the seawater the brackish water up you still hearing me yeah, yeah. yes yep uh, if the commission would like, I can address that. Yes, please. Okay, so a well is designed, um, in this case, they're gravel packed wells. And so their opening is a slotted screen placed at the very bottom of the well. So the pipe or solid piping will extend to that lower screen zone, which is usually some 10 to 20 feet, depending on how much permeable sand we have. And so the extraction or the draw into that casing is through that screen zone down deep. How deep though? Uh, so the, the depth of the saltwater interface, right, is certainly dependent on the amount of fresh water over top of it. And it's usually 10 feet to one in terms of a density difference, right? So Every island or say the Cape Cape is an example for every 10 feet of fresh water, you need to go hundred feet into the ground. And so it's hard to explain that uh, verbally, mm -hmm. but in this instance, we would expect we'd be going almost exactly to the same depth as well one. Okay. I, I just, um, you know, I've been trying to educate myself because obviously I'm not a scientist and I've been trying to read through mountains and mountains of science and look at charts and case studies about Cape Cod and coastlines in California and the, the trouble they've been having in Florida. 
And I've just been trying to wrap my head around why there's so much information about saltwater intrusion. And I, I guess I, I can't seem to wrap my head around it here on Plum Island. Um, it seems to me as though you're disturbing a fresh aquifer, whereas the existing work well was not in a fresh aquifer at all, or, or according to what I understand. And now it seems to me that you're, you know, tampering with, I mean, you're essentially drilling into a freshwater aquifer and you're mixing the salt and the freshwater. I know that that's kind of simplified. I, like I said, I'm not a scientist, but I guess I'm, I'm concerned about that creating future erosion, contamination. You know, I just... I want this to be done right. You know, I, I, I just want it to be done right because I really love Plum Island and it would be very sad for me, you know, if a big storm came and just wiped us all out. But I, I, I fear that we're heading in that direction if we don't make some changes. So that's my concern really, like, why do you need to draw through or near or whatever the freshwater aquifer? That's, I know that's gonna be difficult for you to understand to explain to a lay person, but uh, maybe you could try. Um, again, the commission, would you like me to try? I don't know. <laughs> if you yes. can. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, underlying any big sand deposit or island deposit, that lower zone is supported um, by the ocean's hydrostatic head. So that saltwater zone is recharged by the surrounding ocean. If you're reading about saltwater intrusion, it's a different issue. The issue of saltwater intrusion is when people put wells in the freshwater zone above it and they pump too hard and the saltwater rises up, it up cones into, the, into the freshwater zone. In this instance, we would be creating um, a draw from that lower salty zone, which is recharged by the surrounding ocean. Okay. And so Perfect. it wouldn't affect the freshwater lens uh, like overdrawing from the freshwater deposits. And so uh, it's a different different issue. And I, and I, I don't want to confuse them. Um, so that's why we're screening it discreetly down deep. We'll drill until we find this, the uh, you can measure this salinity while you're drilling, and we're trying to look for zones that are uh, around 10,000 uh, micromoles, which is seawater is about 30,000. So we like it to be salty uh, and brackish, um, and we certainly don't want to go too deep because it just costs a lot more money to go too deep. So this is sustainable for Plum it's Island. Yeah, so there, again, there's no change in the amount of water that the plant needs, and it's been operating at these rates for over 30 years. I think one thing you, you, you've got to realize as far as disturbing the fresh water is it's just a pipe that's going through it that doesn't have any way of gathering any fresh water. That's correct. It's sealed off it's sealed in the fresh water zone. Right. So is it possible that that pipe could eventually say corrode or there could be some fissures that start contaminating anything there or am I like barking up the wrong tree here? No, um, so that's why we're abandoning the old well properly. Uh, we're filling it with cement. This new well, the, the actual hole that's drilled will be larger than uh, the eight inch casing and there'll be cement placed against sand and then the steel pipe. So the steel pipe has um, generally got a 50 to 100 year life if it's encased in cement. Okay, so it's just a matter of, of how do you monitor something like that? You just wait until there's problems or, I mean? Well, they monitor the wells periodically. If fresh water to, were to leak into the well, they would see their salinity drop and then the the casing could be video inspected and another replacement well drilled and this one abandoned as well. But again, these two wells have been there since 1980s and um, that's, you know, a good 40 years and we're not abandoning them because the casing is broken. We're abandoning it 
because the well's no good and it's in a bad spot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you know, I, I feel a little bit more comfortable. <laughs> Yeah. Christina, if, if I could just mention, you asked about the wastewater discharge. I just want to let you know that that a, a discharge out into the river would be considered a point source discharge, and that would have to be permitted by EPA under their National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permits. And so my guess is that the reason why they don't go to the city's sewer system is because the water has been tested and is clean enough to be discharged directly to the river. It would have to have been tested and be monitored to make sure that it is clean. It's probably cleaner than what comes out of our wastewater treatment plant, which also is discharged into the river. Mm -hmm. I think that's exactly right, Julia. Um, but I can't, I, I'll try to confirm that for Christina. Uh, in the next week or so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, that's not really what's at issue in terms of the NOI, but um, I'm, I'm happy to try to get those answers for anybody that wants them. Yeah, it's all, you know, it's all interrelated. And I know there are different departments and I'm not familiar with them, but I just needed to feel like I had to have a voice in the situation rather than sit complacently by. And I, I felt like I needed to understand some things. So I really appreciate your time. Understood. And um, mm -hmm. thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, anybody else from the uh, public? No, so this is uh, Jeff Kennedy. Yeah. I'm, I'm the uh, shellfish plant manager. I'm wondering if I could just address a couple of questions that uh, Christina had. Sure. Um, the, uh, uh, the outfall is, just as Julia said, uh, uh, we do test the, uh, the, the, the water going out, uh, draining from the plants, plant uh, tanks, and they are cleaner than river water. We are both responsible for monitoring coastal uh, um, shellfish areas for uh, clamming. And so we have to get out, we have to be out in the river and testing those areas uh, uh, at least monthly. And uh, our real concern is fecal coliform contamination. Um, and we, we do that both out in the river and we'll, we'll, we monitor our, our, our effluent uh, going out of the tanks, as well as we daily we test our, uh, our salt water for, uh, for fecal contamination. That is really our concern, is that the fresh water would actually contaminate the salt water. So uh, we, we test that all the time, the water goes out, uh, the effluent is, is generally zero. Uh, there's, uh, we have such uh, uh, powerful uh, UV units to sterilize the water. It's, uh, it's very, uh, it's overkill. But uh, we need to do that because we need to provide the clams with clean water. So uh, what's going out into the river is actually cleaner and we don't add anything else to it. It's just salt water at the same uh, salinity. I think it's, uh, it varies a little bit. I think uh, from, the, uh, from the well water, it's 30 to 32 parts per thousand. And uh, the river water is, is 32 to, to 34 at high tide. And it can be down to 15 to 20 at low tide with just river water. Um, and then as far as uh, why, sh you know, why not uh, put it into the sewer? Um, uh, we've had, we had that discussion before with the operators and they don't want to take that risk of adding salt water to the uh, to, to sewage um, as it may impact uh, some of their uh, their bugs at the treatment plant. Uh, so uh, that's really not an option. And the volume is pretty high. It could be as high as, uh, well, maybe 5,000 gallons a day. And that would be a significant uh, 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 tax on the, on the sewer system. So I, I, I don't think uh, the operators would be in, in favor of that either. Um, can I ask you a question, Jeff? Certainly. Um, how do you deal with, this is not going to be a popular thing to say, but how do you deal with boats emptying their tanks at the mouth of the river? I've, I've literally witnessed boats emptying their, you know, their waste tanks, and I was appalled, blown away by it. Um, I, I was just there about a month ago and um, revisiting the point. Um, and I brought my beach chair there. There were fishermen lined up with their fishing poles. It was beautiful. It was relaxing. And all of a sudden, I see all this white, foamy, brownish, sludgy, foamy kind of stuff and coming from the direction of the boat. 
and it wrapped itself around the captain's lady and her hull and the dock and it sort of made its way clinging to the edge of the water and I was mortified and how did I mean do you find that that's a problem there illegal dumping or emptying of <laughs> boat tanks I know this is not a popular subject but right I'm a, Jeff I'm going to give you a minute to answer that because that, that's got nothing to do with what we're right. talking but, about you know when, when, when you say you're measuring fecal matter I mean I just I don't know I just, just you know, I don't know. Uh, that, ever, ever so question. briefly. Um, yeah, briefly. It's, yeah, it's uh, um, enforcement is generally a, uh, a local harbor master issue and Coast Guard. Um, but uh, Massachusetts is a, a no discharge zone. It's illegal to dump. But I think what you're seeing, and I've seen it for years sitting in my office, is, is natural uh, uh, seawater. It's uh, uh, those enzymes and proteins in the seawater, they, they, they foam up. They, they, the river is, is a freshwater river. It's, uh, there's a lot of tannins in it. There's, it's very brown at times and that can, can flocculate and you can see the, the, the foam and, and it really is just uh, uh, natural processes. I've seen it. I've actually tested it years ago um, and, and it comes up as zero. There's nothing there. So I know it does. I know exactly what you're saying. But uh, I don't believe that what you're seeing is, is actually a, a boat sewage. And I'll stop there. Joe, I, I had a question. With, is the commission in, inclined to approve this with contingent upon any other issues that MISA comes up with for protection measures? Um, well, if they want to do a motion, they can. I'm, I'm not, I'd rather see what MISA has to say. Yeah, okay. I think I'm fine. So. That's fine. Yeah, I, because if they if they come up with any number one any changes to the plans, then then you have to come back. In addition, right. if they propose any special conditions, we would want to wrap those into our order of conditions, which we would Understood. need to vote on. So yeah, it makes sense to wait. It does. That's fine. Sometimes right. you say the condition is uh, that you'll meet all requirements of MISA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Usually we like that first. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, we're we're uh, planning on looking at that MISA study as soon as we can and um, getting it back to everybody. Okay. Um, so do you want a continuance to the next meeting? The 15th, I think. Um, 15th, okay. Jeff, do you have a preference? Is the 15th okay? Uh, that would be fine. Yeah. September. Yep. Okay. Motion to continue to September 15th. Second. All right, Paul Haley. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. Jane Sender. Yes. David Vine. Yes. Dan Warshaw. Yes. Ron DeCola. Yes. And I vote yes. All right, thank you, folks. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, can I get a motion to close the public hearings? So moved. Second. Paul Ely. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. Jane Sender. Yes. David Vine. Yes. Ann Warshall. Yes. Ron DeCola. Yes. And I vote yes. Um, first item is enforcement violation and violations uh, 1176 Street. Can you get Tom? Yep, let me, let me just uh, unmute him. Tom, can you unmute yourself or do I need to? There you go. No, unmuted. Thank you. Okay. All right. um, so uh, to update the commission, uh, if, if you remember at the last meeting, we promised to come back and give you a sense of the most aggressive timetable we could make on uh, all of the issues. And so I'm back to do that. Um, today, I emailed in a uh, copy it's a picture of a contract with the fence installer who committed to doing the uh, removal work by the 28th. However, I understand that they've been able to move up their schedule and they actually expect to start this week. Um, Everett Chandler is under contract and he's getting the field work scheduled. It's in queue, but it's, it hasn't been done yet. Um, so given that the deadline for the mid-September meeting is um, is not that far away. I think it reasonably, I think we can make the first meeting in October. I think 
we have to both get the at ground survey done and then we have to go from there to um to then recreate kind of forensically with a whole bunch of photographs and we do have some excellent photographs um what the pre-existing condition is so we can then come up with you know an noi that properly brings things into compliance with the regs based on that pre-existing condition um the uh the plan for the front fence i wanted to make sure is is good with you guys and that is all of the panels would be removed but the uh, fence posts would remain and um i wanted to discuss with you the plans for the back fence and julia i don't know if you can put that image i emailed in today up. um when did you email the image because um, i don't like have mid-afternoon um it's just a picture of the or if you have a picture of the back fence um, I, I don't have it set up because I'm at home. I don't. I, it's, right. okay. I can only access it through my to the, through the. All right. So let me. So so the back fence is probably you know ninety percent closed. It's it's a um, very tight picket. Maybe there's a half inch or something between the pickets. So it's pretty much a solid stockade fence. And we have two options. One is that every other picket gets removed, which takes care of the fifty percent, and then the bottom rail is moved up and the and all of the pickets that remain are cut about two feet shorter than they are so the bottom of the fence is completely open and then everything above that above the two feet is 50 is 50 percent um open the client reached out to me this afternoon and asked what about another option which would be to remove every either every two or every three slats i think it would end up being three um, to create the entire thing at 80% open. So I wanted to present those two choices to the commission. The one drawback with that is it would still be a horizontal piece that's maybe three inches deep at the bottom that the, um, on these vinyl fences, you have to have your um, pickets have to rest into a, a crossbar. So on the first option, the one we were, that's actually sort of presented on that graphic I sent in we would lift the crossbar up above the two feet or at two feet. Um, on the second option, the crossbar would remain about three inches above grade, and the, but the pickets that go into it would uh, would be spaced out, so we still would have 80% open. Um, and what's he, he has a, a child and a dog, so how does the, uh, how, do, how do they, move around the backyard if the uh, bottom. Right, so, so, okay, is that the, the this bottom? This is our just example. Type, from right, that's a type of fence, now. although I think the bottom rail, that looks a little thicker than the one I think he's got, but it's very okay. simple. So, um, so if you can picture that bottom rail on the six foot fence image there being moved up and then we talked about him using plantings or something like that and then possibly using you know, a, a chicken wire or something like that. This this was just some way he's trying to figure out how he can repurpose the fence um, that's there because otherwise it gets completely removed and then he's got to then, you know, either find something that fits with those existing posts or he's got to redo all the post work. And um, so it may be that we then later have to come back to the commission and make sure it would be okay to either put a, you know, a, a vinyl coated chicken wire type thing. Along. If you want an example, Tom, it's, it's not vinyl. It's not the sort of vinyl coated fence, but it's a wood fence, but something like this took place on 73rd street at the top yep. um, on the corner with Northern Boulevard. I don't know the address off the top of my head, but um, their fence was modified. Um, it was more like a solid fence or nearly solid fence and they modified it to meet their, our standards and you can go take a look. And I believe they did use some sort of um, protective chicken wire or something at the bottom to keep their pet in, but essentially right. it's open. So you could take a look at that if he, if he wants to see an example of what he could do. Right. I know he's comfortable that the every, every other slot, he could do it with the two feet, but I think he was thinking he'd have um, I, I'm not sure he's, he, um, I'm not sure if, if, if we went with every three slats being removed, if, if that openness would then create the issue with, you know, with the kids and the dog that he may be, he may be thinking that it would be a little bit more closed. 
but so the question would that crossbar if we can show that even with the crossbar it's 80 percent open would that be acceptable because you would have the crossbar itself being solid for those you know whatever and Tom, is there a way you could like submit a sketch of, of what you're talking about so we can take a look at it? It's hard to say without right. being able to see, you know, the actual openness and evaluate it looking at something concrete. Right, right. As I said, we just discussed it this afternoon. So I, what I can do is I can try to, um, I've got to go out and, and or have him measure those um, slats and openings and all that. And then I can figure out how many would come out and then I can create a graphic and email that in. Um, so whatever, I guess what we could do since we're going to be doing that work possibly this week is why don't I try to get that to you in the morning and then if it's acceptable to you, we would, um, we just go forward with something that, that is acceptable to you in terms of retrofit of the fence. Um, I, but I don't know, it's not, doesn't need to be acceptable to me. It needs to be acceptable to the commission. Right. So, so I guess the question is if, if I can show that it's 80% open, but it has that crossbar within the bottom two feet, is that an acceptable thing to the commission or do you want the crossbar out of the bottom two feet? Because that, that's the ultimate question. We can figure out the retrofit after yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, I think for me, I want that two, I want that out of the bottom two feet because it's, it's straight across blocking, you know, at least three inches of, uh, of sand movement. And I, I want to see it, or I'd like to see it up to the uh, two foot mark. Right. Okay. Is that yeah. so the commission? I, I agree with that. Anybody else? Yep. I agree. Yeah, no, I, I think that's probably the, uh, the better thing to do. Okay. So, so we will, um, I'll work with, with Bobby. We'll, we'll, the graphic I sent in, is really just a picture of it with a, a verbal description. I will mark that up better for you, Julia, with exactly what we'll do to retrofit to have right. that bottom two feet, you know, the the meet the 80% okay. openness without a horizontal member. Okay. Uh, and then uh, and then I'll talk to him about whether we need to stretch chicken wire or, you know, rabbit fence type thing across there um, as well. But but we are moving forward. Um, with everything, you know, as I said, surveyors under contract, the fence people are under contract to do this. And as soon as we get the existing conditions survey of current conditions, we'll then forensically create a pre-existing conditions plan, much as we did on uh, a couple other projects that have been before you with enforcement um, to then try to figure out how we bring everything into compliance uh, based on what was there before. Um, and Julie, when you get that drawing from Tom, can you uh, send it out to uh, all of us, blank carbon yep. copy, so no one applies to all, and we can yes. comment on. Uh, okay, will do. I, I will try to get that to you as early as I can tomorrow. Okay. Tom, sometime yep. before we actually get the NOI, could you send us the, the pictures you're using for your forensic analysis? Yeah, I will, I will. Um, I'm still compiling them. I'm trying to reach out to the realtor who listed it because they have like 40. I can download them one at a time off the internet, but it's very painful. So um, I'm trying to get all those and then I can share them. Um, I, you know, I certainly would be including them with the NOI anyway, in terms of right. demonstrating that our pre-existing condition plan is accurate. Um, and yeah, I just like to take a look at them ahead of time. Yeah, I mean, if you go when you search the address and you go to, uh, you know, search the address, it should come up on realtor.com and you'll see 40 some odd photos there. Okay. Um, and what you will see is like the entire backyard was all patio brick. Um, you know, but, but it also looks like there was vegetation here and there and there is vegetation now. So we need to quantify and figure out, okay, you know, how much how much additional vegetation if the numbers don't work, how much do we need to add and all of those things. So we're going through that process. Okay. But yeah, we need that fence uh, redone ASAP because it was yeah, supposed he, to be done before this meeting. Right, he tried and, and the, the um, fence person basically committed to a date certain that it would be done by, which was the 28th. and. 
Um, he understood it had to be done by today, so he's been leaning on them, and uh, and it sounds like they're going to be able to start this work this this week. Okay. Okay. But but the one thing is, I don't think I'll be able to get an NOI filing by your deadline, which I think is the twenty eighth for that September fifteenth meeting. So I think it'll have to be your first meeting in October. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Tom. You. Okay. All right, take care. Okay. Uh, do we have anything else? We do not. I don't have anything else. Anybody got any anything you want to bring up? Not non-application specific. Yeah. Motion to adjourn. There we go. <laughs> Oh, I do have one question though. Table that. All right. This no, not table you, table Steve said. This is a quick question <laughs> about the Zoom meetings that we've been having since, you know, last April or whatever, whenever we started this April. Um, the city council is sort of discussing whether or not they'd like to go back in a hybrid, you know, sort of part in person public meetings and um, some people could be on Zoom, they'd have limited public access to the actual meeting, but some people would be there. Regardless, I don't, I don't, I'm not actually familiar with all the details, but what I wanted to know from you all is just to get a sense of how you feel about how the Zoom meetings have been going. Do you feel like you have had an easy time participating? Do you feel not to speak for the public, but do you, is your impression that the public has had adequate access to our meetings? Um, I, I think they have adequate. Yeah. We, we've certainly had more people listening to and commenting at, at some of these applications than we normally do in, uh, when we're at the uh, um, senior center. Right. And I certainly have no problem doing this. I actually think they're kind of efficient in, in a lot of ways. I mean, as far as uh, the consultants being able to join us, they are being able to join us tonight. I mean, it just makes so, a lot, so much easier in a lot of ways. Yeah, my only issue is that I'd, I'd like to be able to see the, the people that are speaking. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. And we could potentially allow that. Um, we can work on that. Um, it just is a matter of Andy changing the settings in this webinar system, the way he set it up, it doesn't allow that right now. But yeah. um, I mean, we haven't had any quorum issues, so that's been useful. Um, but anyway, if any of you have any concerns about it one way or another, feel free to email me if you have concerns about going back to an in-person meeting in the near future, let me know if you have concerns about the way we're doing it now, also let me know. Um, I, I would prefer to continue with the on, online, at least for, for now. Yeah, I would too. Yeah, I, I wouldn't, I, I don't want to go back uh, at this point. Yeah. No, that's what I need to know. Yep, agree. Okay. All right. All right, thank you. Okay, um, we'll revisit Steve's motion. I'll second it. Paul Haley? Yes. Steve Moore? Yes. Jane Sander? <laughs> yes. David Vine? Yes. Ann Warshaw? Yes. Ron DeCola? Yes. I said yes. Glad you could glad you could make it, Dan. Sorry to be uh, a little scraggly getting on. I apologize. Well, I, I like seeing uh, your back. Glad you made it. Yeah, glad you yeah. made it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've, I've got a sick dog here, too. She's licking everything. She, oh. and she's eating grass. I'm, I'm just chasing her around the yard. I don't know what's going on. So, <laughs> right. so See, this is this better. You could, you could hop on Zoom rather than having to leave your dog tonight. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> and Steve can sign on when he's on vacation. Yeah. Yeah. I would have to that other meeting, but I didn't have any uh, Wi-Fi to do it with. So. All right, guys. Thanks, everyone. Well, okay. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.